something greater than ourselves, an organization, uh, a belief system, like all of us here, you live for something. The question is, what do you and I live for? Or better yet, who do you and I live for? And so the one thing that we kind of established a few weeks ago, um, coming out of 2 Timothy chapter 1, was that God desires that we would leave a legacy, that our life matter, that our life would actually um, mean something when it's all said and done, that, that when you and I pass away and, and people read our tombstone or people read a little write-up in the newspaper or online or people are commenting on Facebook, like, what would be some of the things that people would say about your life? Like, would you want to be known as the one who is the one who twerks on everybody at the party or would you want to be the one who is known <laughs> like as the one who prays for people, the one who loves people? Like, would you want to be known as the one who's always lying or the one who's always manipulating people to get what you want or would you want to be remembered as somebody who lived a, not a selfish life, but a selfless life. All of us are going to be remembered for something. That is our legacy. All of us are going to leave behind something. That is our legacy. The question is, what will you and I leave behind when it's all said and done? Prayerfully, all of us here in this room, you will graduate from ODU at some point. The question is, what will you have left behind that made ODU better than when you actually got here? That's what God calls us to be. That's what God calls us to do. He calls us to leave a legacy. And so we started that series um, two weeks ago, and uh, we kicked it off coming out of 2 Timothy chapter 1. And so you can go back. You can go back online. Um, for those of you guys who are on Facebook, you can find us at The Real Fo at the Right Focus. That's our Facebook page, at The, at the Right Focus. Our Twitter uh, account is at The Real Focus. And then we also have um, an account online with YouTube where we store all of our videos and past messages. It's at Focus ODU. So YouTube at Focus ODU, you'll be able to find all of our past messages from last week when Trey, when Trey taught to, to the previous week when we started the message to the week before that when we talked about relationships. Like every study and every message you could always find online. And then you could also go to our website at focusmin.org to get more info. So tonight I really want to kind of continue um, our series, Legacy Outlive your life, and I uh, want to come from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. So if you're sitting next to somebody who, who does not have a Bible, just share your Bible with them. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13, ending at verse 16. If you don't have a Bible, you probably at least have a phone, right? Uh, matter of fact, if you got a phone, just pull it out real quick. Let me see real quick. If you got a phone, just pull it out real quick. Like, this is actually pretty cool that you guys should take out your phone and, in the middle of Bible study and wait. Like, cool, awesome. You got, some of you guys are scared. Like, I don't want nobody to see my phone because I don't want nobody to get no ideas to steal my phone. Cool, I understand. But take out your phone. If you don't have a Bible, you can go to BibleGateway.com. You can pull up um, uh, opportunity. You can pull up that app and pull up that website to be able to um, follow along in Scripture with us. Matthew 5, first book of the New Testament, beginning at verse 13. And we're going to read all the way down to verse 16. So not a whole lot of verses. Um, but definitely very, very powerful. Matthew 5, beginning at verse 13 and ending at verse 16. This is what it says. You are the salt of the earth. Everybody say salt. salt. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be Hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Let's go back to verse 13. You are the salt. Everybody say salt. salt. Verse 14, you are the light. Everybody say light. light. Great. So what we want to talk about tonight, if you're taking notes and you're looking for a fancy little message, sermon, Bible study title, I will title this, Leaving Your Mark. Leaving Your Mark. Some of you guys are very uh, visually minded like myself, and so there were a few things that popped in your head right there. I don't know what they were. Maybe it was a dog <laughs> peeing on a tree. What? Right? <laughs> right? Dog, you, like, some of you guys have dogs, and you've seen your dog do that, like they're marking their sort of territory, right? Um, some of you guys may uh, have gone, like, you know, a very... You know, holistic perspective where it's like, man, somebody really had a deep impression upon me. Um, or if you're like uh, me when you were in Walmart the other day and or in the store the other day, you saw somebody who was walking through the store with their neck wide open and this huge mark there and it probably was not a birthmark. <laughs> Do not act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right. Okay. 
Um, that's a mark, okay? I don't need to go into any further detail about what that mark was. But nonetheless, it is a mark, and that mark is always channeled or directed or connected to something else. It stands for something, right? So just like the dog will go to a tree and mark its territory, it's, it's essentially leaving a mark. And the reason why this is so important, the reason why this is so powerful is because you and I have been created by God to have and to make an impact during our short years of life. Let me help you understand something. You and I have no clue as to how long you and I are going to live. We have no clue. I mean, there's people being shot and killed day by day. There are people dying in car accidents day by day. There are people dying just because, like natural life causes, day by day. Like, there's no guarantee that you will make it to 30 years old. There's no guarantee, if you're 19, that you will make it to 20. There's no guarantee that at 22 years old, if you're there, that you will make it to 42 years old. There is no guarantee. And so because that's the case, the question you and I have to ask ourselves is, how am I making my life count, right? There's a verse in Psalms that says it like this. It says, Lord, teach us to number our days or teach us to count our days, right? One translator would say it like this, or, or we could say it, instead of teach us to count our days, it's, it could also mean teach us to make our days count. It's like, teach us, Lord, to make our days stand for something or to count for something where we're not just living life just recklessly, right? Like, you came to college and, like, some of us, when we came to college, you came to college, like, eyes wide open. You were ready to go in. You already had an idea of how many parties you were going to average a month. You already had an idea how many blunts you were going to throw back. You already had an idea how many bottles you were going to throw back. You already had an idea of things that were going to take place in your life, right? And so the question we have to ask ourselves is even with that, was I living for myself or was I living for something greater than myself, right? Like, if you were like me when I was in college here at ODU, like freshman year, I was like, hey, you know, I'm just going to kind of chill. I'm not going to wild out too much, but I'm going to do my thing freshman year, then I'm going to get serious about sophomore year. That's not a good strategy. Some of you guys can identify with that. Here's the reason why, I'll be transparent, that wasn't a good strategy because that wound it, it ended me, uh, it, it allowed me to, it put me in a position where I wound up being on academic probation after the first semester. Not a good look. <laughs> Freshman year, when you have somebody like your mother paying for you to go to college, she's like, hey, you got one more semester to get in the gear, or I'm pulling you out. Reality check real quick. Some of you guys can identify with that because you're like, yo, that's my testimony. I know exactly what that feels like because ultimately I wasn't living for something greater than myself. It wasn't really about, it was more so about me than it was about what God wants and when you and I live our lives more so about what we want than about what God wants, we will always, as John Piper writes so eloquently in his book, waste our life. And if you and I are not careful, you can be right there, right now, wasting your life. So how do you know your life is mattering? It's not mattering. How do you know <laughs> your life is meaning something greater than just stuff on the surface? Like, how do you know that your life counts for something. How do you know you're not just another number here at Old Dominion University? How do you know that you're not just another student of the 20-some thousand plus students who pay tuition every year, who are freaking out trying to figure out what's going to happen next semester, who are freaking out trying to figure out where I'm going to stay and, and am I going to be able to come back next year? How do you know that you're not just a number? Great question. You know that you're not just a number based upon what kind of impact you're having in your life. Are other people's lives better because you walked into their lives? Or have you and I made people's lives worse since we entered it? I mean, we know people like that, right? Like, you know that there's certain people, when they come around, they bring drama. Right? Like, you were cool, you were chilling, calm, collected. I mean, I'm talking about like, having a great day. Like, today, like, it was nice outside, it was cool, you know, but at the same time, you could wear some shorts if you wanted to. You know, that was your cup of tea, right? And you're just chilling, and then all of a sudden, somebody just comes out of nowhere, bringing all this drama. It's like, yo, ain't got time for that. Like, why? Like, I was cooling it out. I was, I, I was enjoying this great day. I, I, I was reading my book in front of a lion. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then this person on the skateboard just comes and messes my time. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you, you know people like that. You've experienced things like that. But if you're not careful, what can easily happen is if you lose focus on what your life is really to be about, you and I will end up wasting our lives. We're just engaged in senseless activities that really amount to nothing. Let me help you understand something. Your degree is very important, but at the end of the day, it is just a piece of paper. I say it again. Your degree is important, but at the end of the day, it is just a piece of paper. 
I had an engineering professor tell me, he kind of shut us all down, because you know, when we were in engineering, he was like, hey, we're gonna graduate and we're gonna make just crap loads of money. Like, we're gonna make, we're gonna come out of college making 70, 80 grand working at North Grumman or working at the shipyard or working at Lockheed Martin, and we're just gonna be paid. Like, give us a job as soon as we graduate. That type of arrogance and cockiness, right? And our professor, and I, and I hated this professor, I probably shouldn't even say that, but I did not like him, right? <laughs> not because he said this, but because he was just like one of the first teachers, man. But he knew his stuff, he was just terrible. But don't give me on my soapbox. But, but he, he would say things like, he says, your degree does not guarantee you a job. All the, thing, the only thing that your degree shows the average person who's hiring, the average employer, is that you're teachable. That's it. Just because you got a degree don't mean that they owe you a job. They owe you anything. You need them, they don't need you. Right. It was like a very sobering, it was like quiet all across the room, just like that, right? It was like, oh man, wow. So what does that mean? Do I just drop out or <laughs> keep going to class? I mean, because he just said, that's not what he was saying. What he was really articulating was like, you cannot put, you cannot put your hope in an accomplishment. You cannot put your faith, you cannot live for an accomplishment. You cannot live for goal. No, you have to live for something much greater than that. Living a legacy. What will your life mean when it's all said and done? When you and I finish the chapter of our lives, what will we be remembered for? How will we have made a difference? How will we have made an impact? Are we leaving a legacy? What kind of legacy is it? Have we left our mark? Right? Like, can somebody say, like, hey, they came to ODU and ODU was made much better because they were there. Michael Jordan, right? I love Michael Jordan. He's like my favorite basketball player of all time. He came into the NBA and impacted the league. Like, before Michael Jordan came in, people were wearing shorts like right here. I'm not exaggerating. Go type in 1980s basketball and you will see shorts were like right here, right? When Michael Jordan came in the league, like one year he wore those shorts and then the next year he had shorts like right here. And he would always kind of pull them down like this. And he would always get reprimanded because people were like, that's not the style of the NBA. That's not Jerry West on the logo, right? Like, you gotta have short shorts. <laughs> it's all about wearing short shorts, man. My daughter was like, no, man, I'm not wearing no short shorts. <laughs> and next thing you know, little by little, other players were like, hey, you know what? We don't have to do this anymore. Let me get an extra large instead of a medium. <laughs> right? And then now, fast forward 20 some plus years later, what is everybody wearing? Regular shorts. To Same thing with the armband, man. I used to love my Jordan, so I would have like all the armbands. I had the elbow band, the little jet, you put it right in the forearm too, right? Like Michael Jordan made that joint super popular. Like nobody was wearing armbands here. Like you either had a headband or you had a wristband. You didn't have an elbow band or you, know, you didn't have that. It was really all about fashion for real for more. I mean, it's not like it enhanced your basketball skill, even though as kids we thought so, like, hey, if I got an armband right here on my elbow, I can hit a fadeaway jumper like Mike. No, it don't make you any better than what you were before you put the jank on. You just look good. It don't mean you can ball good. Right? But Mike made it popular. So now what's happening? Now you got people wearing sleeves all the way up to their neck. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Start with Mike. Then let's get to the shoe game, right? Dude had enormous amounts of shoes that came out while he was playing basketball. I'm talking like patting other breads. I'm talking, you know what I'm saying, the 10s. I'm talking, you know what I'm saying, the, the, the 15s. Like he was. He was putting out shoes like left and right, the Bugs Bunny joints. I mean, just everything. These, these shorts right here, man. You know, it's, it's just crazy. Like, he, he just kind of changed the game, right? Every year he was having shoes. And, and, and they would just kind of get more expensive and more expensive and more expensive. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about because y'all buy Jordans and, you know, you kind of follow that. But here, I'm going to tell you how he transcended the game and how he impacted the game. And not just impacted basketball, but impacted culture. The man's been retired for years, and his shoes are still selling out. It's safe to say that Michael Jordan has impacted basketball and culture. But prior to him coming into the league, none of this would have happened. So what it shows is even on the surface, one person can really make a major impact. Do you know that we probably would not have computers if it wasn't for people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates? Mind you, Bill Gates dropped out of college. Not encouraging that. <laughs> just, I'm just letting you know. Mark Zuckerberg, what would we be without Facebook? Do you realize if there was no Facebook, there would be no Twitter? Do you realize that? Dropped out of college. Not encouraging that. 
don't understand what I'm saying. My point is this, that they had something greater in mind. They thought about something greater. This pastor named Rick Bazette, he says this, he says, I love this quote, he says, we are not remembered by our entrance, we are remembered by our exit. It's not about how you were when you came in. It's all about how your life looked once you exited. Right? Well, people be able to say, man, they started good, but then they ran out of gas before they even got to the finish line. Nobody talks about losers, right? other than the fact that they lost. Like, that's not what sells headlines. Like, everybody's always talking about the people who won a championship. Like, last night, UConn beats Kentucky. You know, they're not going to be talking about Kentucky 10 years from now, how they lost to UConn. They're going to talk about UConn and how they beat Kentucky. Because it's, it's about finishing the race. It's about leaving a legacy. I'm not saying that you're going to win every battle. I'm not saying that you're going to be super successful in everything that you do. That's not my point. But my point is this. That's all about your legacy and what you and I are leaving behind. Our lives have far greater value than you actually think. It's bigger than you going to class. It's bigger than you just graduating. It's about your life and what kind of life are you living and what kind of life are you leading. The scriptures say that without a vision the people perish. And the people cast off restraint. In other words, it says, without a vision, there is no order. There is no direction. There is no infrastructure. There is no system. If you don't have a vision of where you're going, where are you going? You don't know. So you just end up settling for anything and anybody because you have no vision of who you should be with and where you should be. So now you just settle. You just kind of do whatever. And so now when, when it's all said and done, the write-up of your life and my life when we settle is, man, that was a person who had a lot of potential but never maximized it. That was a person, man, they had dreams, they had goals, they had so much creativity, they had so much talent. The Lord had a lot of great things for them. They were super duper gifted in this area, but they never did anything with it. Is that really what you and I want to be remembered for? I don't think so. Not at all. We are not made simply to work a job. We're not made to simply just raise a family and have kids and, and work a job and make a lot of money and, and retire and die. That's pretty much the system and the order of life, like you, you're born, you grow up, you go to college, you graduate, you get a job, you get married, you have kids, you retire, you die. That's a crappy life. That's whack. I mean, there's no joy in that. And if you're like me, it's like, man, there has to be something more than this. There has to be something more than just get a job and get a degree and get money and get a family and get married and have kids and then retire and just, and just die. You know, it's, it's, it has to be more than that. You know, I was blessed this past weekend by my mom. Um, and <laughs> laughing like she can't bless me. <laughs> but, like, you don't never talk about your mom. Right? Uh, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Uh, anyway, she's mad. Girl. I love her. But, um, I was blessed this Sunday, Saturday, by my mom because my mom, she's made a decision to be a part of our church, which, which is super duper humbling in and of itself. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to kind of be able to wrap my mind around pastoring my mom and she's the one who changed my diapers. It's weird. Um, <laughs> but she said something this past Saturday that really kind of blessed me. We were talking about finances. We were talking about, um, you, know, you know, how people are when they retire. And she was like, you know, I really realized that the more I've grown in my relationship with the Lord, you know, I don't really care too much about retirement. I, I just want to give everything I have to the body of Christ. What? Let's put this in context. This is somebody who's been working in the school system for 20 plus years, and if you know any good teacher, they ready to retire. <laughs> Some of you guys right now, you're in education and you're, and you're aspiring to become a teacher, but you've already thought about it. You're like, hey, I'm getting 25 years, and after that, I'm done. Bad to your kids. Ain't nobody gonna me up. I know, I ain't dealing with this. It's a wrap. But, 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 but through the years, God has kind of changed her perspective. It's, it's, it's less about, man, I can't wait till I retire, and more about, I can't wait till I get to school to be able to impact kids. To be able to show them who Jesus is, to be able to show them through my living, not because I can't preach to them because I get put out of school, but, <laughs> but, but to love them with the love of Christ because there's so many kids that come from families where there is no love. So I end up being a teacher and a parent. It's kind of weird. But she said that this past night, and, and it blessed me because I was like, man, this is... This is somebody who's double my age, who has much more at stake, who's very close to retiring. But she says, you know what? Who cares how much I have in retirement? I just want to give everything I can to the Lord. Man, that's awesome. That's legacy. That's what it's about. 
And, and my hope and prayer is that I would be able to get to that point where I can say that. 20 some plus years from now, my prayer is that all of us will be able to say that, you know what, I don't live myself, you know, it's, it's not even about me anymore. It's, it's, it's really more so about what does God want to do through my life. God has created us and called us and he's commissioned us to ultimately make an impact on earth. Right? Not, not just to be somebody who just volunteers and does great things. No. It's about ultimately being the light of God, being the salt of the earth that Jesus talks about here in Matthew chapter 5. This is a verse in Isaiah 64, 8 where it says, Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are the work of your hand. Paul echoes this in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where he says, We are the workmanship of Christ. We are the handiwork. In other words, God has created you. He's molded you for his Glory. He's molded you so that way you and I could be an example to other people. That's why it's so important that you just don't spaz out when you go through tough times in life. Because now what happens is if I spaz out, then I'm exhibiting that I'm not really trusting God. And if other people are watching me not trust God, what makes them trust God at the same time? God wants to use you for his glory. Here's a, here's a, if you're taking notes, it's a great thing to write down. If you don't get anything else out of the night. Here's what I want to say. We have been impacted by Jesus so we can make an impact for Jesus. That's what it's about. You have been impacted by Jesus so you can make an impact for Jesus. I'll say it one more time. We have been impacted by Jesus so we can make an impact for Jesus. And it does not take a whole lot of people to do that. We are still talking about what Jesus did 2,000 plus years later. And you know how many people he had in his first crew? Twelve. And one of them was a phony. But twelve ragtag, uneducated, unschooled, unlearned dudes who only knew how to fish and collect taxes in a dishonest way, like Matthew, the guy who wrote <laughs> this letter, this gospel, he used these ordinary guys to do an extraordinary work. That's the same for you. Like, you think that, oh, I'm just a junior here. God doesn't have big, yes, he does. There's this movie out called God is Not Dead. I haven't seen it, but I've heard a lot about it. I want to see it. It's actually surprised a lot of people at the box office. Like, every week, they're like, oh my gosh, why is this movie still making millions? It's crazy. And from what I've heard, the story is all about this college student who has this particular spat with his professor. The professor is an atheist, the college student is a Christian. And so you have this whole dichotomy of professor who's an atheist, who does not believe in God, and the student, ultimately, who does believe in God, and through his life and through his witness, really kind of begins to cause the atheist professor to reconsider his ways. A man who's taught and professed that he does not believe in God his whole life, essentially. But now one ordinary college student sitting probably like in a room like this, who raised his hand and said, no, God is alive. He did send his son, Jesus, in the midst of a class probably of hundreds who were just either falling asleep, won't pay attention to what the professor said, didn't care what the professor said. But this one student took a stand. I think the reason why he did that is because he understood that I've been impacted by Jesus to make an impact for Jesus. If you don't think that you can even minister to your professor, that's a narrow perspective. If God can use a student to reach a professor who is far from God and lead him to Christ, you can do the same thing. You can do the same thing with your family members. You can do the same thing with the roommates that you just can't stand. Like, y'all were real cool in the beginning of the year, but now, like, it's April and you just hate each other. Like, like God can use you to reach them, but, but it takes a recalibration of the mind and understanding that God has called me to make an impact, and when we fail to make an impact on the lives of people, we ultimately miss the purpose of why God has created us and why God has called us. His call is something greater than ourselves, an organization, uh, a belief system. Like all of us here, you live for something. The question is, what do you and I live for? Or better yet, who do you and I live for? And so the one thing that we kind of established a few weeks ago, um, coming out of 2 Timothy chapter 1, was that God desires that we would leave a legacy, that our life matter, that our life would actually uh, mean something when it's all said and done, that, 
that when you and I pass away and, and people read our tombstone or people read a little write-up in the newspaper or online or people are commenting on Facebook, like, what would be some of the things that people would say about your life? Like, would you want to be known as the one who is the one who twerks on everybody at the party or would you want to be the one who is known, <laughs> like, as the one who prays for people, the one who loves people? Like, would you want to be known as the one who's always lying or the one who's always manipulating people to get what you want or would you want to be remembered as somebody who lived a, not a selfish life, but a selfless life. All of us are going to be remembered for something. That is our legacy. All of us are going to leave behind something. That is our legacy. The question is, what will you and I leave behind when it's all said and done? Prayerfully, all of us here in this room, you will graduate from ODU at some point. The question is, what will you have left behind that made ODU better than when you actually got here? That's what God calls us to be. That's what God calls us to do. He calls us to leave a legacy. And so we started that series um, two weeks ago, and uh, we kicked it off coming out of 2 Timothy chapter 1. And so you can go back. You can go back online. Um, for those of you guys who are on Facebook, you can find us at The Real Fo at the Right Focus. That's our Facebook page, at The, at the Right Focus. Our Twitter uh, account is at The Real Focus. And then we also have um, an account online with YouTube where we store all of our videos and past messages. It's at Focus ODU. So YouTube at Focus ODU, you'll be able to find all of our past messages from last week when Trey, when Trey taught to, to the previous week when we started the message to the week before that when we talked about relationships. Like every study and every message you could always find online. And then you could also go to our website at focusmin.org to get more info. So tonight I really want to kind of continue um, our series, Legacy, Outlive your life, and uh, I want to come from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. So if you're sitting next to somebody who, who does not have a Bible, just share your Bible with them. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13, ending at verse 16. If you don't have a Bible, you probably at least have a phone, right? Uh, matter of fact, if you got a phone, just pull it out real quick. Let me see real quick. If you got a phone, just pull it out real quick. Like, this is actually pretty cool that you guys should take out your phone and in the middle of Bible study and wait. Like, cool, awesome. You got, some of you guys are scared. Like, I don't want nobody to see my phone because I don't want nobody to get no ideas to steal my phone. Cool, I understand. But take out your phone. If you don't have a Bible, you can go to BibleGateway.com. You can pull up um, uh, opportunity. You can pull up that app and pull up that website to be able to um, follow along in Scripture with us. Matthew 5, first book of the New Testament, beginning at verse 13. And we're going to read all the way down to verse 16. So not a whole lot of verses. Um, but definitely very, very powerful. Matthew 5, beginning at verse 13 and ending at verse 16. This is what it says. You are the salt of the earth. Everybody say salt. salt. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be Hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Let's go back to verse 13. You are the salt. Everybody say salt. salt. Verse 14, you are the light. Everybody say light. light. Great. So what we want to talk about tonight, if you're taking notes and you're looking for a fancy little message, sermon, Bible study title, I would title this, Leaving Your Mark. Leaving Your Mark. Some of you guys are very uh, visually minded like myself, and so there were a few things that popped in your head right there. I don't know what they were. Maybe it was a dog <laughs> peeing on a tree. What? Right? <laughs> right? Dog, you, like, some of you guys have dogs, and you've seen your dog do that, like they're marking their sort of territory, right? Um, some of you guys may uh, have gone, like, you know, a very... You know, holistic perspective where it's like, man, somebody really had a deep impression upon me. Um, or if you're like uh, me when you were in Walmart the other day and or in the store the other day, you saw somebody who was walking through the store with their neck wide open and this huge mark there and it probably was not a birthmark. <laughs> Do not act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Right. Okay. Um, that's a mark. Okay, I don't need to go into any further detail about what that mark was, but nonetheless, it is a mark, and that mark is always channeled or directed or connected to something else. It stands for something, right? So just like the dog will go to a tree and mark its territory, it's, it's essentially leaving a mark. And the reason why this is so important, the reason why this is so powerful is because 
You and I have been created by God to have and to make an impact during our short years of life. Let me help you understand something. You and I have no clue as to how long you and I are going to live. We have no clue. I mean, there's people being shot and killed day by day. There are people dying in car accidents day by day. There are people dying just because, like natural life causes, day by day. Like, there's no guarantee that you will make it to 30 years old. There's no guarantee, if you're 19, that you will make it to 20. There's no guarantee that at 22 years old, if you're there, that you will make it to 42 years old. There is no guarantee. And so because that's the case, the question you and I have to ask ourselves is, how am I making my life count? Right? There's a verse in Psalms that says it like this. It says, Lord, teach us to number our days or teach us to count our days. Right? One translator would say it like this, or, or we could say it, instead of teach us to count our days, it's, it could also mean teach us to make our days count. It's like, teach us, Lord, to make our days stand for something or to count for something where we're not just living life just recklessly, right? Like, you came to college and, like, some of us, when we came to college, you came to college, like, eyes wide open. You were ready to go in. You already had an idea of how many parties you were going to average a month. You already had an idea how many blunts you were going to throw back. You already had an idea how many bottles you were going to throw back. You already had an idea of things that were going to take place in your life, right? And so the question we have to ask ourselves is even with that, was I living for myself or was I living for something greater than myself, right? Like, if you were like me when I was in college here at ODU, like freshman year, I was like, hey, you know, I'm just going to kind of chill. I'm not going to wild out too much, but I'm going to do my thing freshman year, then I'm going to get serious about sophomore year. That's not a good strategy. Some of you guys can identify with that. Here's the reason why. I'll be transparent. That wasn't a good strategy because that wound it ended me, uh, it, it allowed me to, it put me in a position where I wound up being on academic probation after the first semester. Not a good look. <laughs> Freshman year, when you have somebody like your mother paying for you to go to college, she's like, hey, you got one more semester to get in the gear, or I'm pulling you out. Reality check real quick. Some of you guys got identified with that because you're like, yo, that's my testimony. I know exactly what that feels like because ultimately I wasn't living for something greater than myself. It wasn't really about, it was more so about me than it was about what God wants. And when you and I live our lives more so about what we want than about what God wants, we will always, as John Piper writes so eloquently in his book, waste our life. And if you and I are not careful, you can be right there, right now, wasting your life. So how do you know your life is mattering? It's not mattering. How do you know <laughs> your life is meaning something greater than just stuff on the surface? Like, how do you know that your life counts for something. How do you know you're not just another number here at Old Dominion University? How do you know that you're not just another student of the 20-some thousand plus students who pay tuition every year, who are freaking out trying to figure out what's going to happen next semester, who are freaking out trying to figure out where I'm going to stay and, and am I going to be able to come back next year? How do you know that you're not just a number? Great question. You know that you're not just a number based upon what kind of impact you're having in your life. Are other people's lives better because you walked into their lives? Or have you and I made people's lives worse since we entered it? I mean, we know people like that, right? Like, you know that there's certain people, when they come around, they bring drama. Right? Like, you were cool, you were chilling, calm, collected. I mean, I'm talking about like, having a great day. Like, today, like, it was nice outside, it was cool, you know, but at the same time, you could wear some shorts if you wanted to. You know, that was your cup of tea, right? And you're just chilling, and then all of a sudden, somebody just comes out of nowhere, bringing all this drama. It's like, yo, everybody got time for that. Like, why? Like, I was cooling it out. I was, I, I was enjoying this great day. I, I, I was reading my book in front of a lion. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then this person on the skateboard just comes and messes my time. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you, you know people like that. You've experienced things like that. But if you're not careful, what can easily happen is if you lose focus on what your life is really to be about, you and I will end up wasting our lives. We're just engaged in senseless activities that really amount to nothing. Let me help you understand something. Your degree is very important, but at the end of the day, it is just a piece of paper. I say it again. Your degree is important, but at the end of the day, it is just a piece of paper. I had an engineering professor tell me, he kind of shut us all down, because you know, when we were in engineering, we were like, hey, we're going to graduate, and we're going to make just crap loads of money. Like, we're going to make, we're going to come out of college making 70, 80 grand working at North Grumman or working at the shipyard or working at Lockheed Martin and we're just going to be paid, like, give us a job as soon as we graduate. That type of arrogance and cockiness, right? And our professor, and I, and I hated this professor, I probably shouldn't even say that, but I did not like him, right? <laughs> not because he said this, but because he was just like one of the 
are his teachers, man? But he knew his stuff. He was just terrible. But don't give me on my soapbox. But but he would he would say things like he says your degree does not guarantee you a job. All the thing, the only thing that your degree shows the average person who's hiring, the average employer, is that you're teachable. That's it. Just because you got a degree don't mean that they owe you a job. They owe you anything. You need them. They don't need you. Right. It was like a very sobering. It was like quiet all across the room, just like that. Right. It was like. So what does that mean? Do I just drop out or <laughs> keep going to class? I mean, because he just said that's not what he was saying. What he was really articulating was like you cannot put you cannot put your hope in an accomplishment. You cannot put your faith. You cannot live for an accomplishment. You cannot live for a goal. No, you have to live for something much greater than that. Living a legacy. What will your life mean when it's all? said and done. When you and I finish the chapter of our lives, what will we be remembered for? How will we have made a difference? How will we have made an impact? Are we leaving a legacy? What kind of legacy is it? Have we left our mark? Right? Like, can somebody say, like, hey, they came to ODU and ODU was made much better because they were there. Michael Jordan, right? I love Michael Jordan. He's like my favorite basketball player of all time. He came into the NBA and impacted the league. Like, before Michael Jordan came in, people were wearing shorts like right here. I'm not exaggerating. Go type in 1980s basketball and you will see shorts were like right here, right? When Michael Jordan came in the league, like one year he wore those shorts and then the next year he had shorts like right here. And he would always kind of pull them down like this. And he would always get reprimanded because people were like, that's not the style of the NBA. That's not Jerry West on the logo, right? Like, you gotta have short shorts. <laughs> it's all about wearing short shorts, man. Michael Jordan was like, no, man, I'm not wearing no short shorts. And next thing you know, Little by little, other players were like, hey, you know what? We don't have to do this anymore. Let me get an extra large instead of a medium. <laughs> right? And then now, fast forward 20 some plus years later, what is everybody wearing? Regular shorts, down to the knees. Same thing with the armband. Man, I used to love my Jordan, so I would have like all the armbands. I had the elbow band, the little jacket, put right in the forearm too, right? Like Michael Jordan made that joint super popular. Like nobody was wearing armbands here. Like you either had a headband or you had a wristband. You didn't have an elbow band or you, know, you didn't have that. It was really all about fashion for real for more. I mean, it's not like it enhanced your basketball skill. Even though as kids, we thought so, like, hey, if I got an armband right here on my elbow, I can hit a fadeaway jumper like Mike. No, it don't make you any better than what you were before you put the jank on. You just look good. It don't mean you can ball good. Right? But Mike made it popular. So now what's happening? Now you got people wearing sleeves all the way up to their neck. You know what I'm saying? It started with Mike. Then, let's get to the shoe game, right? Dude had enormous amounts of shoes that came out while he was playing basketball. I'm talking like patent leather breads. I'm talking, you know what I'm saying, the 10s. I'm talking, you know what I'm saying, the, the, the 15s. Like, he was, he was putting out shoes like left and right, the Bugs Bunny joints. I mean, just everything. These, these shorts right here, <laughs> you know? It's, it's just crazy. Like, he, he just kind of changed the game, right? Every year he was having shoes. And, and, and it would just kind of get more expensive and more expensive and more expensive. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about because y'all buy Jordans and you know you kind of follow that. But here, I'm gonna tell you how he transcended the game and how he impacted the game, and not just impacted basketball, but impacted culture. The man's been retired for years, and his shoes are still selling out. It's safe to say that Michael Jordan has impacted basketball and culture. But prior to him coming into the league, none of this would have happened. So what it shows is even on the surface, one person can really make a major impact. Do you know that we probably would not have computers if it wasn't for people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates? Right. Mind you, Bill Gates dropped out of college. Not encouraging that. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just letting you know. Mark Zuckerberg, what would we be without Facebook? Do you realize if there was no Facebook, there would be no Twitter? Do you realize that? Dropped out of college. Not encouraging that. <laughs> don't don't mis understand what I'm saying. My point is this, that they had something greater in mind. They thought about something greater. This pastor named Rick Bazette, he says this. He says, I love this quote. He says, we are not remembered by our entrance. We are remembered by our exit. It's not about how you were when you came in. It's all about how your life looked once you exited. Right? Well, people be able to say, man, they started good. But then they ran out of gas before they even got to the finish line. 
Nobody talks about losers, right? other than the fact that they lost. Like, that's not what sells headlines. Like, everybody's always talking about the people who won a championship. Like, last night, UConn beats Kentucky. You know, they're not going to be talking about Kentucky 10 years from now, how they lost to UConn. They're going to talk about UConn and how they beat Kentucky. Because it's, it's about finishing the race. It's about leaving a legacy. I'm not saying that you're going to win every battle. I'm not saying that you're going to be super successful in everything that you do. That's not my point. But my point is this. That's all about your legacy and what you and I are leaving behind. Our lives have far greater value than you actually think. It's bigger than you going to class. It's bigger than you just graduating. It's about your life. And what kind of life are you living in? What kind of life are you leading? The scriptures say that without a vision, the people perish. And the people cast off restraint. In other words, it says without a vision, there is no order. There is no direction. There is no infrastructure. There is no system. If you don't have a vision of where you're going, where are you going? You don't know. So you just end up settling for anything and anybody because you have no vision of who you should be with and where you should be. So now you just settle. You just kind of do whatever. And so now when... When it's all said and done, the write-up of your life and my life when we settle is, man, that was a person who had a lot of potential but never maximized it. That was a person, man, they had dreams, they had goals, they had so much creativity, they had so much talent. The Lord had a lot of great things for them. They were super duper gifted in this area, but they never did anything with it. Is that really what you and I want to be remembered for? I don't think so. Not at all. We are not made simply to work a job. We're not made to simply just raise a family have kids and, and work a job and make a lot of money and, and retire and die. That's pretty much the system and the order of life. Like, you, you're born, you grow up, you go to college, you graduate, you get a job, you get married, you have kids, you retire, you die. That's a crappy life. That's whack. I mean, there's no joy in that. And if you're like me, it's like, man, there has to be something more than this. It has to be something more than just get a job and get a degree and get money and get a family and get married and have kids and then retire and just, and just die. You know, it's, it's, it has to be more than that. You know, I was blessed this past weekend by my mom. Um, and <laughs> you're laughing like she can't bless me. <laughs> but, like, you don't never talk about your mom. Right? Uh, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Uh, anyway, she's mad. Girl. I love her. But, um, I spent this Sunday Saturday by my mom because my mom, she's made a decision to be a part of our church, which, which is super duper humbling in and of itself. I, it's, it's hard for me to kind of be able to wrap my mind around pastoring my mom and she's the one who changed my diapers. It's weird. Um, <laughs> but she said something this past Saturday that really kind of blessed me. We were talking about finances. We were talking about, um, you, know, you know, how people are when they retire. And she was like, you know, I really realized that the more I've grown in my relationship with the Lord, you know, I don't really care too much about retirement. I, I just want to give everything I have to the body of Christ. What? Let's put this in context. This is somebody who's been working in the school system for 20 plus years, and if you know any good teacher, they ready to retire. <laughs> Some of you guys right now, you're in education and you're, and you're aspiring to become a teacher, but you've already thought about it. You're like, hey, I'm getting 25 years, and after that, I'm done. Bad to your kids. Ain't nobody gonna me up. I know, I ain't dealing with this. It's a wrap. But, 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 but through the years, God has kind of changed her perspective. It's, it's, it's less about, man, I can't wait till I retire, and more about, I can't wait till I get to school to be able to impact kids. To be able to show them who Jesus is, to be able to show them through my living, not because I can't preach to them because I get put out of school, but, <laughs> but, but to love them with the love of Christ because there's so many kids that come from families where there is no love. So I end up being a teacher and a parent. It's kind of weird. But she said that this past Saturday, and, and it blessed me because I was like, man, this is... This is somebody who's double my age, who has much more at stake, who's very close to retiring. But she says, you know what? Who cares how much I have in retirement? I just want to give everything I can to the Lord. Man, that's awesome. That's legacy. That's what it's about. And, and my hope and prayer is that I would be able to get to that point where I can say that. 20 some plus years from now. My prayer is that all of us will be able to say that, you know what, I don't live myself, you know, it's, it's not even about me anymore. It's, it's, it's really more so about what does God want to do through my life. God has created us and called us and he's commissioned us to ultimately make an impact on earth. 
Right? Not, not just to be somebody who just volunteers and does great things. No. It's about ultimately being the light of God, being the salt of the earth that Jesus talks about here in Matthew chapter 5. This is a verse in Isaiah 64, 8, where it says, Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are the work of your hand. Paul echoes this in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where he says, We are the workmanship of Christ. We are the handiwork. In other words, God has created you. He's molded you for his Glory. He's molded you so that way you and I could be an example to other people. That's why it's so important that you just don't spaz out when you go through tough times in life. Because now what happens is if I spaz out, then I'm exhibiting that I'm not really trusting God. And if other people are watching me not trust God, what makes them trust God at the same time? God wants to use you for his glory. Here's a, here's a, if you're taking notes, it's a great thing to write down. If you don't get anything else out of the night. Here's what I want to say. We have been impacted by Jesus so we can make an impact for Jesus. That's what it's about. You have been impacted by Jesus so you can make an impact for Jesus. I'll say it one more time. We have been impacted by Jesus so we can make an impact for Jesus. And it does not take a whole lot of people to do that. We are still talking about what Jesus did 2,000 plus years later. And you know how many people he had in his first crew? Twelve. And one of them was a phony. But twelve ragtag, uneducated, unschooled, unlearned dudes who only knew how to fish and collect taxes in a dishonest way, like Matthew, the guy who wrote <laughs> this letter, this gospel, he used these ordinary guys to do an extraordinary work. That's the same for you. Like, you think that, oh, I'm just a junior here. God doesn't have big... Yes, he does. There's this movie out called God is Not Dead. I haven't seen it, but I've heard a lot about it. I want to see it. It's actually surprised a lot of people at the box office. Like, every week, they're like, oh, my gosh, why is this movie still making millions? It's crazy. And from what I've heard, the story is all about this college student who has this particular spat with his professor. The professor is an atheist. The college student is a Christian. And so you have this whole dichotomy of professor who's an atheist who does not believe in God and the student, ultimately, who does believe in God and through his life and through his witness really kind of begins to cause the atheist professor to reconsider his ways. A man who's taught and professed that he does not believe in God his whole life, essentially. But now one ordinary college student sitting probably like in a room like this who raised his hand and said, no, God is alive. He did send his son, Jesus, in the midst of a class probably of hundreds who were just either falling asleep, won't pay attention to what the professor said, didn't care what the professor said. But this one student took a stand. I think the reason why he did that is because he understood that I've been impacted by Jesus to make an impact for Jesus. If you don't think that you can even minister to your professor, that's a narrow perspective. If God can use a student to reach a professor who is far from God and lead him to Christ, you can do the same thing. You can do the same thing with your family members. You can do the same thing with the roommates that you just can't stand. Like, y'all were real cool in the beginning of the year, but now, like, it's April and you just hate each other. Like, like God can use you to reach them, but, but it takes a recalibration of the mind and understanding that God has called me to make an impact, and when we fail to make an impact on the lives of people, we ultimately miss the purpose of why God has created us and why God has lives. That's what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew chapter 5. This, you, in some of your Bibles, you should see all red right now. Like, some of your Bibles is just red, straight red, right? And pretty much this is what uh, we call Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is preaching and teaching on so many different topics. He talks about being the salt and light. He talks about murder. He talks about adultery. He talks about divorce. He talks about prayer. He talks about that. I mean, he's pretty much given like a crash course to what it means to be a follower of his. He's given like the best sermon ever recorded in scripture. Ever. The crowds are just all around him. People are just listening left and right. And just soaking it all up. And it's interesting because... One of the first things that he mentions here is, you are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. 
Before he begins to even talk about prayer, before he talks about murder, before he talks about uh, adultery and, and divorce and, and an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth and having love for your enemies, he first brings him to a place of helping him understand your life has meaning. God created you for his glory. He starts there. Like, that's his thesis. And everything else that comes behind that is just a support. It's amazing. And I believe, like, when he tells us this through Scripture, when he's telling his, his listeners and his disciples, he's really kind of showing us, like, what our lives are to really look like and, and how we can ultimately leave a legacy when it comes to living. And so a few things that he kind of says that I really want to point out. One, number one, he, he really kind of lays the foundation in helping us understand that our life, number one, is an instrument. It's the instrument. Look at verse 13 and verse 14. He says, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. In other words, these two things have a specific purpose. They are used for something. Some of you guys love salt. You sprinkle salt on everything. Bacon, cereal, hamburgers, grits, chitlins, pig's feet. Anything you can get your hands on, I'm getting salts. Give me some salt. Like, just give me some salt. Lemonade, I don't care. Like, you just, you love salt. I, I mean, it's weird, but hey, whatever. Put salt on everything. Salt has a purpose, because what does salt do? Salt adds and brings and, and creates this flavor. It, it seems like it makes stuff taste better than what it actually is. It's weird. It has a purpose. It has a function. It's, it's created for a specific purpose. Jesus says the same thing about light. Light has a specific purpose. Without light, we don't have any direction. How many of you guys have seen that movie, 40 Days of Night, the, the movie about the vampires in Alaska? Right? Scared y'all, didn't it? You can tell the truth, right? It's like, let me turn this light on. This <laughs> No, I'm just but nonetheless, uh, I said that because it was 40 days of darkness. There was no light for 40 days. Can you imagine your life without light for 40 days? I don't know about you, I would freak out. And I mean, then there's vampires. <laughs> Let me bust the bubble. Vampires are not real. I, you know, I, just in case somebody got scared. Like, no. it, would, it would freak me out not to have light. Because without light, we, we can't see. And so what Jesus says is, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. In other words, he says, you're the salt. You bring something to this world that the world does not have. You are the light of the world. You help the world see me because it cannot see without you. That's what you're called to be. The salt of the world, the earth, and the light of the world. God has uniquely created us to bring him glory by impacting others for his name's sake. We are called to impact people wherever and whenever we have the opportunity to do so. Your life is an instrument. You have a purpose. God didn't make you on accident. Like, your parents, some people may have lied to you and said, you know what, we didn't plan on having you, but God did. Some people lied to you and said, you know what, like, we, we tried everything we could to, to, to abort you, and it did not work. God would not let that happen because he had a purpose for you. He had a plan for you. He created you for his purpose glory for his satisfaction to be able to reach other people who are far from him so that way they can be reconciled to him and become a follower of Christ. He wants to use you to be able to reach mad people. Whether it's your family members, whether it's your roommates, whether it's your classmates, whether it's your boo, it doesn't matter. He wants to use you to have an impact on the lives of other people. Paul talks about this when he's talking about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. In verse 7 he says God has gifted us for the quote the, for the common good and the common good is this, to lead people in Christ. That's the common good. Psalm 78 says it like this. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from old. What we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from our children. We will tell the next generation. The next generation. We will tell the next generation. That's legacy. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. In other words, we're going to let our lives be an instrument to display God's glory even to the next generation. Let me ask you a question. Who are you right now mentoring? I know that's weird because like I'm in college. I need a mentor. You're right, you do. But who are you pouring your life out to on a regular basis? Some of us may be saying, oh, but I'm not ready. You know, I still got some issues. Yeah, you're right. You will always have issues. I will always have issues. But that's not an excuse for us not to point people to the cross. Who are you pointing to the cross right now with, with your life? Is, is my life as an instrument, is it playing the sweet melodies of God? Right? As a, as a nice violin or as a cello, as a viola? 
or you just make a whole lot of noise. Like, like when people hear that melody called life in your life, is it like, man, does it, is it, does it make everybody just kind of stop and like, man, this is awesome. Man, this is great. Take that. <laughs> Or, or is it, or is, or is it making this, this, this ratchet type noise where people are like, oh no, like, 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 what kind of sound is your your life making? Is it making a pleasant noise, or is it, is it making a joyful noise, as Scripture says, or is it making kind of an unbearable noise? Your life is, it's, it's an instrument. Jesus also tells us that not only is our life an instrument, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world, but then he also says that your life is to be an illustration for people. Yeah, it's to be an example. It's supposed to be a picture. Verse 15, verse 16 says, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds. The Lord has called us to be an example to others of who he is based upon how we live on a regular basis. You know, some people would never read a Bible, but they will read your life. And based upon your life and based upon my life, some people will shape their theology of who God is. Theology simply means understanding and, and knowledge and study of who God is. They will say, God is mean because you're mean. God, they will say, God is a liar. Maybe it's because we have a tendency to lie. They will say, God must be unloving because these people say they love God, but... They're the worst. People will formulate and kind of develop their own perspective of who God is based upon how you and I live our lives. So what kind of illustration are you and I giving off? What kind of picture are we painting in the minds of people? Like when people think of you and me, do they think of somebody who is, is, is not perfect, but, but is somebody that I can trust, somebody I can go to, somebody that I can lean on and get direction from and get counsel from. Somebody who's kind, somebody who's patient, somebody who's not snapping all the time, somebody who's not trying to, you know, wiggle their way to get whatever they want, but somebody who really genuinely cares or, or is it the opposite? Our lives are illustrations. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 5, 20. He says, we are Christ's ambassadors. You know what an ambassador does? An ambassador goes on the behalf of someone else. Our country, the United States of America, we have ambassadors. They go to other places on behalf of the country, on behalf of Obama. You and I are ambassadors. So when we live our lives, we go on behalf of Christ Jesus. We are the legs and feet of Christ for those of us who are following Christ, which is the best thing that you could ever do, might I add. You are an, an ambassador. You are an illustration. Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah, I love that book. It's one of my favorite books and one of my favorite stories all throughout Scripture. But Nehemiah, he was the cupbearer to the king. In other words, Nehemiah was like really close to the king. Him and the king were like this. Just to kind of give some insight into what a cupbearer was. A cupbearer was the one who would always taste the drink before the king would to make sure that it was not poisoned. Now, I don't know about you. That's a crazy job description. Because you know what that means? Every day you could die. <laughs> I don't know if I would sign up for that job, but Nehemiah did. And he did it for year after year after year. And then one day he got word that his hometown, Jerusalem, had the walls were absolutely destroyed and the city was in ruins and people were coming in. And, and just to kind of give context as to why the walls were so important, because what the walls did was the walls provided protection, <laughs> they, they, they provided safety, and they ultimately brought forth some element of provision. It brought order, it brought structure. And so without walls, anybody could just come and go in the city. Anybody could come and steal. From them in Jerusalem, anybody can come and steal families, steal livestock, steal money. You know what it's like? It's like, it's like you living in a house without a frame. It's like it's almost like kind of like a glass house type joint. Like you have no boundaries, there's no structure. And so Nehemiah was burdened by God with his vision to go back home and to rebuild the walls. But it was interesting because you know he went to the king, he was like, hey, you know, I'm burdened by this, I have this vision. Please let me go back and 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 do this great work and rebuild the city, essentially. And so God, through Nehemiah, through Nehemiah's position, rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And on top of that, they didn't just do it like in any time. They did it in record time. They did it in 52 days. Now, I don't know about you. Like, there's spots here in Norfolk that's been under construction for like five years. 
right? These cats did this joint in 52 days. These weren't just walls like this. Walls of a city. A city. Huge. Huge back then. But Nehemiah used his position to be able to help people see what God wanted to do in their lives by rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. He used his position to leverage the will of God. That's what it was about. So how does this look in your life? Where has God placed you in your life? What kind of job has God given you? What are you doing on campus? Maybe you run some things in SGA. Maybe you do something in OSAL. Maybe you're a part of an organization. Maybe you're like the president. Maybe you run this. Maybe you run that. Awesome. That's great. Do you really think that God put you there just for your own sake? God put you there to use you to reach people. That's ultimately what it's about. He wants you to leverage that influence and that authority that you have for his glory. Let me, let me kind of clarify this. This does not mean that because you run an organization, you're like, hey, we're going to read the Bible before we start any meeting. I'm not saying that. That's not, that's not how you do it. No, you use your life. Let your life shine. You are to be an illustration, a picture. When people picture you in their minds, they, they picture somebody who, who's outstanding. Somebody who, who, who resembles people like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where the Bible talks about how they had just this excellent spirit about them. Like everything that they did was with a spirit of excellence. That even when people tried to come against them, like God just had a guard roll up against them, uh, around them, saying, like, hey, you can't touch my people. Matter of fact, God says like this. He says, touch not my anointed, do my servant no harm. Because ultimately, when you're living for him, uh, as one author says, you are immortal. There's nothing that anybody can do to harm you. There's nothing that anybody can do to stop you because you're no longer living for yourself. You're living for the Lord. You are immortal. You know what that simply means? That you're not going to die until God says so. You ain't got nothing to worry about. That's, how, that's why I think like Paul could be absolutely bold. Like When you look throughout the book of Acts and the Bible talks about how he and his crew were shipwrecked, and all the people on the boat are going crazy. Because there's this massive storm that's come, like some crazy, like tsunami type weather, and they are like, yo, we are going to die. You know what Paul's saying? Like, hey, man, first of all, we're not going to die. <laughs> Pause! How do you say that with so much swag and confidence? <laughs> we're not going to die. He's just chilling. Hey, we ain't going to die. We ain't. <laughs> Today ain't the day, y'all. What you mean? You see Katrina out here? What, what, what you talking about? You see the tsunami out here? We're about to die. The boat, like water's coming in the boats. We're about to die. No, we're not. It's going to be tough, but we ain't going to die. And the Bible says, they didn't die. <laughs> because you are living for the Lord. You are living on purpose. And you are leaving a legacy behind. Because you are living for something and someone who is much greater than yourself. Let me help you understand something. If you live just for the accolades of people, and if you live for accomplishments, be understanding of this. That at some point, they will amount to nothing. If you live so I can get more money in the pocket, here's the reality. You will never have enough money in your pocket. You will never be content. <clears throat> some people say, hey, if I could just get to this status, I'll be good. No, you won't. Because if you're not content with where you are right now, you won't be content with where you'll be later on. Because you're not living for something greater than yourself. You're living for yourself and yourself alone. But here Jesus says, listen, your life is to be an illustration of my glory. His last thing that we're done, he says, not only is your life to be an instrument, it's to be an illustration, but I love this, your life is to also be an influence. I kind of mentioned a little bit about that in the last point. Verse 16, he says, let your light shine. And then at the end of verse 16, so that people will see your good deeds, and I love this part, and praise your Father in heaven. Do you know that is the end goal of your life? That the reason why God created you and I was so that way other people would see our lives and ultimately see him when it's all said and done? So that way other people will live lives submitted to the cross of Christ? That's ultimately what it's about. That is when your life has purpose. I love the movie like The Matrix because like The Matrix really kind of gives almost a great picture of how life is. Like you have this false reality, right, where you have all these great things, you have this great food, you have these great cars, like everything is just almost perfect, right? And, 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 and but, but behind the scenes is the real world. And the real world is crummy, it's nasty. That's ultimately how it is when you and I 
live outside of purpose. That world is not what you think it is. That joint will chew you up and spit you out quick. Like, you could be shouting like, oh, stop, I worked so hard, I got this degree, I got this job. Boom, it's good. Oh, my gosh, I'm loving this. And then they hit you with a pink slip a week later. How? You know, you got the, lip, the bottom lip quiver. How? How? Right, so you're freaking out. Oh, my gosh, I got student loans to pay. And they're about to kick in, and this interest rate is a monster. I can't go back and ask my parents if I can stay home with them because I pretty much told them I was a grown man and I can do my own thing, you know? Like, oh my gosh, how am I going to live? How am I going to survive? Oh no, what am I going to do? Because you were living for yourself. Stressed out. Some of us can identify with that right now. Because you and I are living for the will of God and not living for the purpose of God. We are living for ourselves. And you wonder why there's so much chaos and calamity that happens in your life. Let me help you understand, there are two types of storms. There are storms that God sends us through, and there are storms that we sign up to go through on our own. Which one are you in right now, if you are in a storm? Some storms we find ourselves in because of disobedience. You want to know somebody who did that? Talk to somebody like Jonah. He'd be the first to grab the mic. Hey, uh, so, uh, yeah, I was disobedient. <laughs> Watch this. We laughing, but here's where it gets serious. I was so disobedient, I, and I recognized it. I sat with my eyes wide open. I knew God was calling me to go preach to the people in Nineveh, but I didn't want to. So I ran. A little coward, a little sissy, right? I ran. And in me running, not only was I wrecking myself, but I almost wrecked and destroyed the lives of about three other men on the boat. Because when you and I are living for ourselves, we not only, like, mess our own lives up, but now other people who are connected to us get caught in the fire. That's why it's so important that you don't live for yourself. Because if you are connected to people who you have relationships with, and you're living for yourself, then you have to understand that, that whatever happens to you is, is going to trickle down into them. And then they're going to make a decision like, hey, we can't be friends no more because you're doing some crazy stuff. I'm not going through the storm with you. I ain't paying my bills. No. You can't live like that. You have to live your life on purpose. Every day, living your life with the intent in mind that I live for the Lord. I don't live for anybody else. That's ultimately what it's about. To see people come to know God. To see people praise our Father in heaven. That's ultimately what it's about. It's that influence. Paul says it like this in Acts 26 to 20. He says, look, he says, I preach that they may repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by the deeds. You know, I, I love that because for me as a pastor, as a preacher, this is like one of the most important verses for me because a lot of times, like I see so many pastors and preachers who preach for all the wrong reasons and so many people who get into ministry for all the wrong reasons. Like, it's like, hey, you know, we just want to make a difference and hey, we just want to, you know, speak positive stuff and hey, we just want to encourage people. Let me, let me help you understand something. If the gospel ain't preached, cats going to hell. That's the end goal. I know we don't say that word a whole lot because we get scared. That's what God has kind of been pumping into me like, listen, dude, I, I want to give you the Cliff Notes version of what happens when you don't preach. People will go to hell. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But how can they hear if nobody preaches? So now it just kind of brings me to a place of fear and trembling. Like, yo, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. That's what Paul says. I have no choice but to preach. So I'm like, I'm going to preach whether it's two people in here on Tuesday night. Or 2,000. Because, because I'm thinking about the end goal. I don't want to see you waste your life. I don't want to see you like 10 years from now and, and, and your life sucks and it's miserable. Because you didn't hear the gospel. Because you didn't hear what Jesus was talking about here on the, on the Sermon on the Mount. And so now, my life has to be an influence so that way people can see who God is. Such as the same for you. It doesn't just apply to me because I'm up here speaking and preaching the word of God week in, week out. We gotta live this. Your life is a legacy. Use your influence. Your life is an influence so that way other people will see God. Philippians 3, 7 through 11, Paul says it like this. He says the only thing that matters in life is people knowing Christ. He says, I wanna know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing with him and his sufferings. So that way at some point I can be like Christ. He says everything else that was to my profit, in other words, everything that I thought was valuable at one point, I now consider it rubbish. Rubbish in the Greek, Greek translation. Old Testament is written in Hebrew, New Testament is written in Greek. A Greek word for rubbish is this word called skibola. You know what skibola translates to? Skibola translates to garbage. There's another word in addition to garbage, dung. Another word, 
Dookie, another word. Doo doo, another word. Feces. Get the point. Get the picture. Right? Dumb. He says everything that was somewhat valuable to me before, all the accomplishments, all the accolades, all the degrees, all the 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 the, the Pharisee of the Year awards that I got, smiling like this, right? Like all of those things, they don't matter. The only thing that matters is knowing Christ. This is not coming from some old rinky dink dude, man. He was a dude who was persecuting the church. He was one of the most zealous Pharisees that you would meet. He pretty much knew the law in and out. If you got in an argument with Paul, you would leave in five minutes crying. That's what, that's what he was about. But he says, you know what? Now that I know Christ, I once was blind and now I see. He says, nothing else matters. And so I want to live my life leaving a legacy behind. So he had people like Timothy. He had people like Titus. He had people like Philemon. He had all these people all throughout scripture that he was constantly pouring into. But you know who he got that from? Jesus. Because Jesus said, I'm going to go take some of the most misunderstood, ragtag bunch of people that nobody really amounts to anything and counts for anything. And through them, I'm going to turn the world upside down. Legacy. That's what it's about. And so what the disciples did, they saw Jesus resurrected. What did they do? They now go all throughout Jerusalem, spreading the gospel. Where do they go now? They go now to Judea, spreading the gospel. Where do they go after that? They now go to Samaria, spreading the gospel. Then you have Paul, spreading the gospel to the Gentiles, the people who are outside of Jews by blood and whatever else may be. Like, and then you have us, thousands of years later, who are still here, hearing the same gospel <laughs> that was preached 2,000 plus years ago. Because they weren't living for themselves. Imagine if, you know, Peter, James, and John who saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew, like, oh my gosh, he just turned white. Imagine if it would have just stopped there. They were like, Lord, just take me to heaven. We don't care nothing about nothing else. It's all about us. Matter of fact, they kind of said that. Peter was like, hey, is it cool if we put three tabernacles here for you? One for you, Jesus? One for Moses? One for Elijah? You know what Jesus says? He says, come on, man. That's not what this is about. That's not, that's, that's, that's not why this happened. This happened so that way you could go be a witness. That's what he told the disciples in Acts chapter 1. He says, go be my witnesses. And you know what a witness does? A witness just tells what they saw. They share their side of the story. You and I are called to ultimately be witnesses. Leave a legacy. It's easy for us to live for ourselves. Babes do that. Me, me, mine, mine, mine. Give me, give me. But, but the mature person says, don't give me, but what can I give you? That's, that's, that's what leaving a legacy is all about. Not what I can get, but what can I give? You know, it's interesting because what I've seen throughout the, the past few years is the churches that God has blessed the most in this country are the churches that give away the most. I think of churches like Church of the Highlands, Pastor Chris Hodges, great pastor, great church. You know what they do? They give everything for free. They give their CDs out for free. They give out free bottles. They give out free coffee. Everything is free. Everything is free. It's crazy. And it's no coincidence that God has entrusted them with 25,000 plus members and they have the fifth largest church in the country. I believe that that is a great picture of what God wants to do in your life and in my life. That when we stop living for ourselves and when we have the mentality that I want to leave something behind. I want to be able to impact people. I want to be able to pour my life out into other people. The fruit is seeing lives changed. That's ultimately what it's about. And God is not one who just says, this is what I want you to do and I didn't do it myself. No. The reason why God expects us to do this is because he started this whole thing. Matter of fact, Paul says like this in Romans 5 and 8, that God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The infamous scripture, John 3, 16, that everybody recites, but not a lot of people understand. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever will believe in him won't perish, but have everlasting life. For he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, to save it. But he gave his son. <laughs> the Lord has called you and I to give. Give your life first to him and give your life for the well-being of other people. That's what it's about. That's why Tuesday night after Tuesday night after Tuesday night, 
Like we'll have a, our, our, our praise and worship team sing week in, week out. I don't know about you, man. That's awesome. They don't get paid. They on time when nobody else is. They practice every week. They rehearse the songs every week. Have not missed a beat at all from September to now. At all. But you know why I do it? Because it's not about them, but it, it, it's about blessing the body, us at large. Legacy. That's what it's about. So the question I want to ask you and I is, are we living for ourselves or are we living for God's greater plan? Am I impacting other lives around me for the glory of God? Am I pouring out my life to see people reach for Christ? Or am I just living for myself? How you know you're living for yourself is because the thing that gives you most satisfaction is when you receive. You know you're not living for yourself. One of the greatest satisfaction is when you give. That brings you the most joy. That's how you know you're no longer living for yourself. Anybody can get excited. Oh, I got all these great gifts. Oh, man, this is awesome. This is amazing. But do you exude that same excitement, if not more, when it comes to giving? If not, then that probably means I'm selfish to agree. Don't stone me, but it's the truth. Am I living for myself? Or am I living for the glory of God? That's what God has called us to. It's all about the word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, God, just so much for you being so bent on leaving a legacy for us to continue on even after we pass away. I thank you, God, so much, God, for men and women throughout Scripture, throughout history, who thought not about themselves, but thought about others. Thought about others, Lord God, who were far from you. So much to the point, Lord God, where they made the decision to pour out their lives so that people would come to know your son, Jesus Christ. And God, I just pray even now in the name of Jesus that you would forgive us, God, for being so selfish at times. Forgive us, God, for living for ourselves. Forgive us for trying to soak in everything that we could get from you as opposed to living for your glory to see others transformed. Tonight, God, we just make a decree and declaration, Lord God, that we're not going to live for ourselves any longer, Lord. Allow us to have so much purpose, so much more meaning, and so much more value when we pour them out for your purpose, for your glory. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name. While every head is still bowed.